Hi everybody, this is Karen Mazzo, and I wanted to welcome you and just let you know that we're gonna start in a couple of minutes. If you could do me a favor, um, those of you that are on already, if you could just write in in your control panel whether you can hear me or not, I wanna make sure that um, everybody can hear me loud and clear and that everybody sees my presentation on their computer screens. So if you could just write in and let me know that you can hear me, that would be great, thank you. And I'm just going to mute you, and we're going to start in about, oh, one minute or two. And wait for other people to get on. Hello all, it's Karen Matzo here, and welcome to this webinar today. We're gonna to talk about some strategies to support universal access to curriculum and instruction, um, all based around universal design for learning. Uh, we are going to, and I'll show you this in a little bit, we are going to get to through mostly um, engagement today, and we will have to do the other aspects of the UDL at a later date. Um, just to orient you a little bit to um, your control panel on the right hand side. I am hoping that you will write in questions. So you can see about halfway down, uh, if there's a place for writing in questions. I will be monitoring the questions during the webinar. You're all on mute right now. So, um, and I do that because basically, with you know, 20, 30 people on, someone's dog barks or someone's child cries or something happens somewhere and then throws off um, everyone else's ability to hear and engage. So I'm keeping you on mute, but I would encourage you to write in those questions. And after the webinar is done, I am going to deliver to you a certificate of hours because I did not have a chance to attach it to the webinar. So as soon as we're done, um, you can expect an email from me this afternoon, uh, letting you uh, know that I know you were here and that you had a certificate of um, for hours, okay? So welcome, I am Karen Matzo from Demonstrated Success. And I'm just gonna go ahead and get started. Certainly, there, there's me. I have um, been doing this for a little while now. I am a adolescent literacy specialist. I am a professional developer. Developer. I am the PD director at Demonstrate Success, and I'm happy to bring some of this information to you today. Okay. So the resources, the um, PowerPoint for this webinar, will be on our professional development resource page. And to get in there, there's a login. All you have to do is Google demonstrate success and create a password, and then you can log into our site. In addition to the hours certificate, I will also send you directions to get on our resource site. Okay, and once you're on that site, 
you can find in the upper right corner here where it says um, select a consortium. The consortium that this webinar, the PowerPoint from the webinar will be housed in is the DS Professional Development Resources. And then you'll go down to, down here where it says webinars, the webinar will be listed and you can click there and then there'll be a recording of the webinar and I will also attach the PowerPoint itself. Okay, so that will be there for you. Um, so we can start now on the content of the webinar. So here's what we're gonna talk about today. We're gonna focus, I'm gonna introduce the UDL principles and the framework a little bit. We are going to focus on multiple means of engagement. The framework itself is very, very big and rich, and it's a lot to think and talk about, so we're just going to focus in the hour that we have on engagement today. And if you'll excuse me, I'm actually going to shut my email off so we don't keep getting notifications. Um, and then we can also, hopefully you will glean some strategies that you can then take away immediately. There'll be plenty of strategies today. Okay, so this is a little comic strip that I wanted to start with. Um, we have this guy who is doing the shoveling. The kids are waiting to go into school. And the, the student in the wheelchair asks if he can shovel the ramp. And then the other kids are waiting to use the stairs. And he says, when I get through shoveling off the stairs, stairs, then I will clear the ramp for you, right? But the student in the wheelchair says, but if you shovel the ramp now, then we can all get in, right? So basically, the idea here is that you, from the ground up, your goal is to take the strategy or the path, right? that allows accessibility for the most kids. And that sometimes you need to think out of the box and beyond the conventional. And so, you know, obviously there's this one fix that focuses on the needs of students with disabilities, right? But oftentimes that fix or that strategy is good for all students. And so if you build that in from the ground up, it will maximize engagement and accessibility for, for all students, not just the ones that have a specific disability. In terms of some foundational ideas in UDL, right, um, we take for granted, and you, you, everyone who's on the webinar knows this, learner variability is the norm. When you're sitting with 20 kids or 25 kids, right, there is no one learner all of the kids in your setting have different needs, different strengths, different weaknesses, right? And then number two, learning variability is contextual. So for instance, I mean, if you have a student who's reading about baseball and he is an avid baseball fan, he will do better with that text than he will do with a piece of text that's also nonfiction that has to do with something that either he's not interested in or she's not interested in or is without context for that student, okay? Um, that also has to do with the environment, right? So one student might learn better in a quiet environment alone, whereas another student might learn better in a social environment with you know being able to bounce ideas off other kids. So, Again, learner variability is contextual. Um, the barrier is in the curriculum or the learning environment. And what this means is we wanna think about strength-based, um, asset-based teaching, right? So we need to come back and think about, well, the barriers exist in either what I'm offering the student, which is the curriculum, or, in my instructional environment or in the instructional strategies or lack of strategies that I'm using, right? So that the goal is to remove as many barriers as we can from the learning environment, from the curriculum, and from our instructional practice. And lastly, variability is predictable. There's always variability. 
again, you're never going to get into a situation where all your kids are on the same page with the same strengths, same weaknesses, same needs. Okay, so in terms of the universal design process, these are the your your three sort of um, your three major foundational pieces. Okay, so we set clear and rigorous goals. We anticipate the barriers from the ground up, and then we design options, okay, to accommodate those barriers or to do away with those barriers. And so those are sort of the major three steps. So there's a um, GPS metaphor with UDL, where with GPS, right, you have to know your current location, GPS knows your current location. So you, so for a student, right, you know where a student is or you know where a group of students is. You set a clear goal, a clear learning objective. In GPS, right, you can put in options. So you might, you might request um, highways only, right? You might request the picturesque route. And um, so you have options for the means that you'll get from A to B, but you know that you need to get from A to B. And then we have multiple representations, right? So there's all sorts of things that we can put in there. We can follow a car, we can follow the, the bowling ball or the, the, there's a beach ball option, right? Or a bird, or there's um, different ways that you can represent your journey along the way. Uh, you can make it bigger, you can make it smaller, you can have it speak to you, you can not have it speak to you. Uh, flexible along the way, so that if you come up against a barrier, right, it'll redirect you into another route. You come up to a traffic jam, you come up to whatever, then you can be redirected, or if you get lost, right, it'll take you back in another direction, but it'll ultimately keep you focused on your target. Your GPS never gives up on you. Right, and so here, this is a link, and, and again, you guys will have this PowerPoint to work off of, but there's a link um, right here in the, in the PowerPoint about this parallel between GPS and UDL, which I think is a really nice teaching tool, and if you decide to take this back to your staffs in some way, it might be, even be a nice article to read to introduce UDL at a staff meeting. Okay. So there are three strands in the UDL framework. Again, we're going to focus on multiple means of engagement today. We're not going to talk a lot about multiple means of representation or multiple means of action and expression. So I'm not going to focus there today, but you should um, by all means go in and um, you can look up, you know, you can do your own. There's plenty of information out there. But here's a little bit fleshing out of these three pieces. I'm not going to talk about the engagement right now because I'm going to go into that in a second. But when we talk about providing multiple means of representation, right, we talk about the what, the what of learning. And you can see some subcategories here that UDL breaks that down into, right? So you want to offer ways of customizing a display of information, alternatives for auditory information, alternatives for visual information, clarifying vocabulary, symbols, syntax, structure, um, supporting the decoding of text. It's all about the what. It's the content itself. It's how we can um, present the content to students um, in, diff in different ways. And lastly, uh, provide options for comprehension, activate or supply background knowledge, highlight patterns, critical features, big ideas, um, this is all to facilitate comprehension, guide information processing and visualization, and maximizing transfer. So there's lots of strategies in there to do for multiple means of representation. And then multiple means of action and expression is more a little bit around um, a little bit around assessment and collecting information. So and then um, a little bit for process. So if we go provide options for physical action, right, vary the methods for response and navigation, tools and assistive technologies, that's where that comes in, um, using multimedia, um, coming down, building fluencies, uh, and with graduated, graduated levels of support for practice and performance, 
And then at the bottom, so, and this is, I think, is the most concrete, you know, helping students with goal setting, being explicit about goals, helping them to set their own goals, um, facilitate managing information, enhance capacity for monitoring progress. This, to me, this last one is really important, both for students and for teachers, right? What are all the different ways that we can monitor a student's progress and that they can monitor their own progress and, and show their learning, okay? So multiple ways for them to show what they have learned. Today, we're gonna really, whoops, delve into the pieces of engagement. So I'm gonna go through each of these items. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 different subcategories. We're gonna start with recruiting interest. So options for recruiting interest, and then we're gonna move into options for sustaining effort and persistence, and then options for self-regulation. So that's where we're going today. And I wanna talk a little bit about engagement. So when we talk about engagement, if kids or anybody, adults, if you're going to be truly engaged, right, you need both high attention and high commitment. And so if we look at this graphic right here, attention, interest, okay, what are the reasons? Why is this important? Students need to understand the reasons and the importance of what they're learning. And then going to the next arrow, the blue arrow, right? They need to show a commitment to learning more and to the process itself. We need to see them going down for the green. It's We can see that when they ask for help, when they on their own go to look for more information or take initiative. And then if we're up by the orange arrow, um, we need to see that students can demonstrate and choose to demonstrate their understanding of what is being taught. So all of these things are necessary for engagement. They have to commit to the process, they ask questions, they ask for help, um, they take challenges, and then they keep repeating this cycle. This guy, Philip Schlechte, he's not alive anymore, um, but he's big into engagement, and he's somebody that if you want to learn more about engagement, you can go check out Philip Schlechte. Um, these are Philip Schlechte's levels of engagement. And if you, <laughs> at the top, we have engagement, right? And we have students that are attending and they are committed. And then underneath that, we have another level of engagement, right, that says strategic compliance. This is high attention with low commitment. So this means, this happens when the task has very limited value to the student, but there is an outcome. So the student knows that in order to get a grade of A, they absolutely have to pay attention and, um, and, and, and engage with the content. But ultimately, if the extrinsic goals are removed, they will give up and abandon ship, okay? In terms of ritual compliance, this is the kid that's sitting in your classroom and staring right at you and pretending that he or she is paying attention to the lesson at hand really effectively but is actually not attending and not receiving the instruction to, um, to, to any great degree, right? So they're gonna learn at low and superficial levels. And then you have students that retreat, right? So they check out, no attention, no commitment, they're checking out. And they're spacing out, their heads are on the desk, they are not turning pages, they're not engaged in the conversation, and you can see that. And then you have the all out rebellion, the kid that basically out, you know, refuses to do the work at, and at all is disruptive, all right? So it's just an interesting thing to think about and a way to, to um, a lens over which you can think about the attentiveness and the engagement in your, in your own classroom. So when we, we talk about recruiting interest, 
When we recruit interest, we optimize choice and autonomy. We also optimize relevance, value, and authenticity, and we minimize threats and distractions. And we're gonna talk about all three, but first we're gonna talk about choice and autonomy. And I want to, with regard to choice, I want you to look at the next few slides and think about, you know, in a lot of classrooms, you have a student, and the student is told that this is the target, and this is how we get to the target, right? So my target is to, you know, get the sum of two numbers, all right? And they may be shown a, um, they, they may be shown how to do that, you know, whatever, um, a number sentence that they're, they're using or an algorithm, and that's it. It gets you from A and gets you to B, which is the target, and, and that might happen in a traditional classroom. Or you might give a student choice, right? You want them to find the answer to a question, and we know that the correct answer, let's say, is B, right? So the correct answer is B, but, you're giving the students a choice of A, B, or C, or of how they're going to complete the task or get the answer or finish. Now here's another piece. You can not only give them choice for how they're getting to the target, but you can give them variety. So they don't even have to choose one. They can do two out of three activities to get to the same target. Okay, so that's where we would have variety and choice. Now this last slide really hits at home because in this slide, we have a changing target, right? So now we have changed the target sometimes for students that need it, for them to demonstrate mastery, okay? And we've given them choice in different paths to get there. And in reality, this is sometimes what has to happen in your classroom, okay? You have to change the learning target at times and or change the method that a student gets to the learning target and give them choices for how they make that progress. You may need to slow the learning target and, and create an interim target. You know, between A and C, you might have to insert a target of B and, and so on. So I just thought that these three slides were sort of illustrative. Um, I thought that this was a fun little cartoon. Um, for a fair selection, everyone has to take the same exam. Please climb that tree. So obviously everyone comes with certain um, biological, emotional, um, experience-oriented limitations and strengths that make it harder and easier to um, to climb that tree, right? And so for some of our animals or some of our kids, we can get them up that tree. And it'll take some different modifications or some accommodations for those particular students. But then there will also be students for whom the tree isn't relevant or um, the target has to be changed right? The learning target simply has to be changed. So that, that sort of um, further illustrates that. And this, this slide is just emphasizing that we all like to have choices and that we should be giving our students choices at every possibility that we can manage within our classrooms. And I emphasize that we can manage. Your goal is to give students as much choice as you can without completely unraveling the working of your classroom and unraveling the effectiveness of learning. And, and just like kids come with varying needs, adults come with um, different capacities for having many things go on at the same time, for giving students choice, for needs for organization. And all I would say here is that I would encourage you all to push yourselves to the limit in terms of what you can uh, tolerate in terms of giving students choice. Okay. 
actually going to skip that one. Um, it's important to optimize choice and autonomy based on the needs of your learners, right? You give them as much as they can handle, and you also take in their preferences. Okay, so the benefits again of choice are you develop self determination, they have pride in their accomplishments, and students will feel far more connected to their learning if they are in the driver's seat. So this particular slide is a series of questions that you can use and ask yourself about choice in your classroom that you can use to help yourself to offer more choices to students. So if we go on the left-hand side, where can I offer choice, right? Can I offer choice of texts, topics? Can I offer choice of um, relevant problems to solve or in the order that I ask students to solve problems? Um, can I give them a menu of options? Can I give them a choice about partners to work with or to do it alone? Um, how to work, where to sit. Can I give them two discussion protocols in a small group and tell them to choose between those two, just choose one of them? Um, can I have students do work and ask me when they hand it in, this is what I want feedback on. If you don't have time to give feedback to all students around all aspects of their work, right? Can you ask students when they hand in a piece of work, what would you like feedback on? Um, can I have students reflect on three out of five reflection questions? Can I give them choice in what steps that I take to reach the goal? Can I give them choices about how I self-regulate the environment? Right. And on the right-hand side at the top, well, and we're just going to deal with the top, um, the top two quadrants. While choosing, right, helping students to self-reflect on how their choice impacted them, what worked well or what works well for you. Um, when you did something similar to this, what worked for you in this situation. I, I'm, I'm a big advocate of the reflection. You know, so after they've made a choice, what worked for you here, what didn't work for you here. Um, you know, what barriers do you anticipate? Like have those conversations with your students what learning choices could help you with those barriers. So in other words, if a student is anticipating that they're gonna be disrupted or they're, if they're gonna have a hard time with the level of noise in the classroom, right? Help them beforehand as a full class, have kids think about, well, what are some of the things that could be barriers for you in this learning and what can you do? Can you move your seat? Can you, you know, have tools in your classroom to allow them to put up um, screens around them? Can you have headphones? Do you, you know, have students think for themselves, might you need headphones for this group work or um, whatever? Can um, you meet a barrier you didn't anticipate and what does success look like for you? Right, so those are some questions. And again, you can access those in the PowerPoint, which I will send to you and also put up on our, on our site. So this is key to managing those choices. You definitely want to um, only start, you don't want to change everything at once. So just start with one or two pieces. Even students in high school need to manage their ability to make choices. So you don't want to give everything to them at the same time. We go from teacher managed to very controlled choice to student managed. And again, you can give choices around content, product, methods, partners, audience. Pick one or two. And this is important. Um, I love this visual for gradual release responsibility. And this is just making visual what I was saying earlier. You want to start out with students having very little control with a high level of support, right? So you want to limit the number of choices and give them a lot of support. And then when you start to give them choices, keep that support high. Okay, and you're going to slowly 
I do, you watch, I do, you help, you do, I help, you do, I watch, right? So you're gonna, it's a gradual guided practice and, and so demonstration, share demonstration, guided practice, independent practice. Some, in terms of recruiting interest, opportunities for choice and autonomy, you can vary the perceived challenge, you can vary the types of rewards and recognition that you offer. You can give them choice around the context or the content for practicing. You can vary your tools used for information gathering, color, design, graphics, layouts. All of this gives them opportunity for choice and it makes them more interested in the work that you are introducing to them. You can vary that, you can give them choice around the sequence and the timing of completion, the products that they do, their learning partners and their audience. Okay. So I want to, this is a little bit about goals. And part of UDL is being very clear about the goals of the learning experience. And I'm going to talk more about this and make this um, more explicit for you. You can have goals that are content. You're not always going to have goals. Sometimes you're going to have goals that are smaller skills, that are standards. You're also going to have behavioral goals. You're also going to have social emotional goals. So when you go into a teaching situation and you go into a lesson, it's really important that you as the teacher know what your goals are. So I want to talk a little bit about this image with the, with the um, butterflies, right? So it says here um, at the top, you have to know the goal, separate the skill from the content. And what, what I'm gonna um, make clear to you is that the content here, right, is butterflies. It's the life cycle of butterflies. The skill here is writing an essay. So we have two different goals here. We have write an essay, and then we have knowing about the life cycle of butterflies. And when you assign work to kids, right, you want to think about, well, what is my goal here? Do I want them to come out of this lesson knowing the life cycle of butterflies? Or do I want them to come out of this series of lessons being able to write an essay? And once you can answer that for yourself, it's easier to give kids choice, right? Because if, if I'm talking about wanting them to know the life cycle of butterflies, right, I might have a rubric that looks like this in the bottom left corner, right? If a student, you know, the ability of a student to name each stage of the life cycle of the butterfly, the ability of the student to describe what happens in each stage, excuse me, I'm sorry about the um, ambient noise, and um, the sequence of the stages, the length of each stage, the optimal climate conditions for butterflies, right? So those would be your learning targets, whether a student could demonstrate that knowledge. And then you would have the opportunity, let me just go back and keep on this one, you would have the opportunity to give the students choice about how they demonstrated that knowledge to you. And they wouldn't have to write an essay because if those were your targets, then that would be what you were after and you would, it would give you an opportunity for that choice. Now, if we take that same sentence, right, and we take out the demonstrate understanding the life of butterflies, maybe it's not about the butterflies, maybe it's about the essay. And in this case, if you look down to the rubric on the right-hand side, right, these might be some of the indicators. Topic sentence tells what the essay is about. Three supporting ideas that connect your topic sentence and the conclusion sentence, right? So that's what we want to see. It doesn't actually have to, the learning goals don't have to do with the butterflies. And then we're free to allow students to choose the topic of their essay, but we're still able to assess the essential target skills. Okay? Because we've separated out what we're really looking for. I'm going to show you a couple um, uh, just tools to use for um, giving a choice of task. Right? I'm sure that many of you on the, on the webinar have heard of choice boards and menus. And so I have a couple of examples here 
on this particular um, reading log and response menu. It's a cute way to give kids some choices. You see the appetizer, you see the main course, you see the dessert, and there are three things within each, um, which within each course, I guess, um, that a student can choose from that will all get at similar targets or even different targets, and maybe they choose something different next time if they want to indeed show evidence of uh, learning all of those different targets. Here's another one. This is a, an example of a math menu. It's the same thing, really. You have your drinks, your appetizers, your main course, and your desserts, and then solve two problems from each column and write the answer in the box and put an X through the box you do not answer, and it's due Friday. And so you see, even in the directions, the students have been given some flexibility about when they do it and what they do. And it's a very empowering place to be for students. And it seems small to us as teachers, but it certainly enhances engagement because it gives them more power and more choice. And here's a, here's a last one, um, repeated edition. It's a math contract. It says, please complete all activities by Thursday. Uh, you do them in the order that you wish, keep your work, and turn everything in together when you are finished, right? So, okay, so those are just some examples of choice boards and menus. Um, in terms of designing these sorts of choice boards, you might, um, this is a good little outline to keep in mind. You might include an interpersonal task, a logical task, a student choice, a musical task. Right, so that just gives you an idea of how to design the different tasks on, on a sort of a menu or a tic-tac-toe board type of um, choice tool. So here we have place value tic-tac-toe. And we have um, all sorts of activities. A lot of them are different um, choosing of cards. Looks like there's to be done together. Here's another tic-tac-toe choice knowledge, comprehension, and application. So you can see here that you can get um, choose more, choose three in a row, and be a pro, and you can add up your points at the end. And if you go for the application, right, you're gonna get more points. So it gives a student um, the ability to sort of decide what the, the rigor will be for them in that situation. In terms of product choices, uh, I created this little wordle for you um, just to, so we could all look at once to see about some of the different product choices, right? Um, just to read a few, we, you could make a campaign, a podcast, a machine, an editorial, you could create a movie, you can create a presentation, uh, you create a book, create a play, and um, a musical. So there's lots of different um, formats. There's lots of different ways that a student can convey similar learning and similar learning targets. So if we talk about choice with regard to audience, right? We can, students can present their learning to peers in the class. They can present their learning to the school community, parents, some sort of governing board. Um, newspapers, you know, writing into newspapers, obviously. And then at the bottom, I think this is really important, you know, audience con via controlled websites, YouTube, iTunes, Vimeo, and podcasts. All of that we know is super engaging for kids. Thank goodness the noise is gone. Um, going on to the next ways to so what we talked about just now was different ways to give students choice and autonomy right we're going to talk about ways to optimize relevance and value and the authenticity of the different tasks that you ask students if a student doesn't believe a particular activity is interesting relevant or within the scope of his capacity or his capabilities it's probably not going to sink in so it's really hard to create interest, but as we know, we all work 24-7 to sort of sing and dance and try to create interest in the work that we are doing with our kids. Um, 
and we have to continue to make to, to try to work really hard to make it relevant. Um, I think this last piece within the scope of his capabilities is super important. Um, and that has to do with modifying the task itself for the, uh, to, for the level of the students with whom you are working. And for some classrooms, that can be giving choices, right? So for instance, if I'm doing the same lesson, right, I can vary the readability of text. That's one really straightforward, obvious way um, to help students feel that an activity is within the scope of his or her capability. Or I can offer increased scaffolding, and that's another way to help a student they feel that it's in their capacity. I can chunk uh, a piece of work or a lesson in a way that makes a student feel that it's in his or her capacity. And I think that um, these are some pieces that we're after all the time and that I think that most teachers know. You want to make it as connected to the learners' lives as possible, culturally relevant and responsive, socially relevant, age appropriate, and appropriate for different racial, cultural, ethnic, and gender groups. So we can't forget about that. Um, you know, a lot of times, especially in sort of rural areas and, and in, in Maine and New Hampshire that we work in, or the opposite in city areas, but since we work more in rural areas um, often, you know, a lot of the references, you have to make sure that your references are familiar to the kids and make them feel comfortable with the content. So we always want to design activities so that they feel authentic and that as much as possible, our kids can communicate to a real audience and the purpose is real. And you know, that's all around problem-based and project-based activities. As much as possible, we want to have tasks that allow for active participation. Inquiry-based is always a great way to go. Exploration, experimentation, instead of Giving information to kids, set up the environment so that they can gather the information themselves. Self-reflection is always really important. Invite personal response, evaluation, self-reflection to content and activities. So when you're up teaching, as much as you can, you know, you're gonna initiate pair share. You're gonna initiate thumbs up for personal response. You are going to have kids, you know, um, do things on whiteboards and then reflect back to their peers, to you. Did I do it correctly? Did I do it incorrectly? You're going to have kids, you know, um, write in exit slips or pass in questions during the lesson or use clickers or to get immediate gratification um, and for them to immediately be able to evaluate their success in a given activity. Um, and this last one's hard, you know, we don't have a lot of time in our classrooms and it takes time to solve no novel and relevant problems, all right? And to, you can't always be making sense of complex ideas in creative ways, but <coughs> nor can we forget that those are the more engaging, oftentimes the more engaging activities, as long as you've brought it to a place the activity to a place where it's accessible by the students sitting in front of you. So some ways just to increase the relevance for kids. One way is to drop hints about the new learning before you reveal what it might be. So maybe the next day um, you might be starting to learn about fractions, right? So. <coughs> At the end of the math lesson previously, you might drop a hint um, about what's gonna happen the next day or if the next day you're learning about some piece of content in science or social studies, right? Um, anything you can do. You might dress up as somebody from that time period. You might send, you know, give out question cards to the kids of what they're, you know, gonna be answering the next day. If everybody had an independent, had their own index card with a question about the content, that it, and then they went into the lesson focused on answering that question for the group. 
that might be a really fun way to pique their interest in learning that's coming. Good old KWL, right? That goes a long way. Kids want to share what they already know. And then they also want to be able to tell you and ask questions of you and make sure that they are going to get their questions answered. Simon Sinek, he's the why guy, right? We're gonna tell them why the learning is important, either for their future learning in the long future or the short future, always attach it back to why this is important. And this last thing goes without saying, and I know there's so much of an emphasis on social emotional learning this year, um, and trauma-informed classrooms. Um, the more personal your relationship is with each of your students, they are more likely to listen to, learn from, and identify with teachers that they trust and that they like. The content gains value because you see it as something that's worth knowing, as long as they have an investment in you. It's similar to parenting, right? If your, parent, if your kids have faith in you, <laughs> they're going to listen to the wisdoms and the non-wisdoms that you, you share with them. That relationship is of ultimate importance. And this we know already, right? If you're not enthusiastic about what you're teaching and what they're learning, then they certainly can't be. So if you're going to, you need to be genuinely invested and have genuine enthusiasm. And this also goes without saying, and you know this, we build on students' prime, uh, uh, background knowledge, their, their um, uh, but there's a word I'm thinking of that I'm not coming up with, but their experience and um, their prerequisite knowledge, okay? So in terms of minimizing threats and barriers to learning, Okay. We're going to talk a lot about environmental barriers, and here are some, some hints and strategies for minimizing those barriers and distraction. The first thing is, right, you want to label everything in your classroom, especially for students who are learning a second language. You want to label everything in their primary language and in their second language. So if their primary language is Spanish and their second language is English, the things in your classroom, materials in your classroom should be labeled in two languages. And in addition to having an image, right? If it's really important. You, and I know that everyone probably who is on this webinar posts a predictable daily schedule. Um, putting an image in with your daily schedule for your non-readers or EL learners is a really good idea. All steps for important routines transitions, how to get feedback during independent work, right? Instead of having your, your kids get out of the classroom, uh, out of their chairs and line up in front of you while you're trying to work with another group of kids, you should have a process for that in place, complete with pictures and, and images to make it clear to everybody in the classroom how to hand in work, how to work in pairs, how to work in small groups, and so on. Make sure that there are some areas for social interaction and quiet areas also to work that are not associated with punishment. And this, I've seen a lot of this in classrooms all around New Hampshire. The tea balance chairs, the balls, the couch areas, rocking chairs, having a different quiet place for students to work, for students to calm down, to collect themselves. And then there's those tools, right? So um, sound blocking headphones, and I've used PVC piping for kids who want to quietly read aloud, and you can put the PVC piping next to your ear, uh, next to your mouth rather, and your ear, and then the noise goes into the pipe and into your ear, and you can hear yourself, but you're not, and you're also blocking out sort of the background sound. So those are some environmental structural pieces to put in to minimize. In terms of minimizing barriers, existing barriers, um, you need to make choices. This is about making conscious choices about background noise, about visual stimulation, noise buffers, um, the number of features or items presented at a time. So sometimes what a lot of teachers do is instead of giving students an entire 
um, math sheet, right, you may put only one item on a page at the same time. So that min minimizes distraction and distress for some students. Uh, there's all sorts of, you know, again, kids can wear headphones. I know teachers that play on the television sort of peaceful images. Um, you can use various color um, lenses for, for kids with reading. Um, there's just a lot of different decisions that, that you can make. Now, in addition to that, varying the pace of the work, the length of the work sessions, um, giving kids uh, breaks, timeouts, um, figuring out how you're going to sequence activities, those all play into minimizing uh, overwhelming sensory stimulation. Varying the novelty or risk is, um, is a really interesting piece. You can't keep kids working at their highest intensity at all time, right? So we definitely want to, if you are going to bring in something new, for example, a new concept, then you want the rigor to be low. Okay, if you're gonna ask kids, don't ask them to take mul multiple risks in multiple arenas. So just to give you an example, if you're if kids are working on working together, let's say they're working in small groups, and you know that this is a skill that you want to encourage in them, I would advise that you keep the level of rigor and the level of cognitive risk lower than you might, right, if you were working in a direct instruction situation. So you, when you're putting kids in a situation of discomfort or they're taking a risk or they're experiencing something new, make sure that only one aspect of the experience is risky or is novel. And, um, and this, so here's just some different ways to control for novelty and control for risk. You know, calendars, we all do this, right? Visible timers are excellent. I know a lot of teachers will project a timer while groups are working together uh, with a pretty picture in the back, or other teachers I know will have a big, big, big old um, sand timer that they, that they use uh, to increase predictability of how much time I have to complete something and during transitions as well you know, to give kids those boundaries so they know exactly what's expected and that the time, the, so they know the expectation and the time they have. Definite saying to class routines, you know, the five minute warnings, I'm gonna give you two more minutes to work on this and then we are going to, right? Um, and just overall, this the bottom bullet is, you know, minimize the unexpected. And this last one is creating an accept an accepting supportive environment. So the social demands, right? Um, there's different things that you can do that um, different kids will be comfortable with, right? So you want to make definite conscious choices about what the social demands of a learning situation are. Uh, like I was saying before, if it's going to be really high rigor, high cognitive load, you might want to make the social demands lower uh, for a particular learning activity. Um, you would want to up the level of support. You would want to provide high, high, high level of scaffolding through graphic organizers, through chunking, through checking in with your students after each step to make sure that they've mastered it and that they're, they're finished. Um, when we talk about support and protection, again, it's that, that scaffolding. And you would want to make um, serious decisions about public display and evaluation, right? You may not want to be calling on kids. You may not want to, if there's a high level of cognitive demands, 
You may not want to be calling on students. You may not wanting to have them um, look at each other's work. So these are all things that going into an instructional situation you need to plan for. And then the last bullet involving all participants in whole class discussions, and again, that's around your pair share, your thumbs up, your small groups, your conversations. You know, when you ask the kids a question, instead of asking them to report back to you in class, tell them to turn to their left or their right or, you know, pair with their partner and discuss this with their partner. And then bring the class back to you. And as they're talking, you can walk around, right? And you can collect a lot of information about their level of proficiency. So this has to do with um, goals and objectives and helping students to um, persist and stay the course. And the way that you do that is by helping them to set goals and objectives for themselves um, or for a team and making those objectives explicit and visible, right? So students can use their charts like bar charts. The more students track their own progress, the more motivated and the more engaged they will be. And the more you can help students to set realistic but optimistic goals for themselves through conferences, in journals, through portfolios, the more engaged they will be. And then again, posting student work as a way to celebrate their prog process as well as mastery. So on this one, I just wanna say, I'm not an advocate of only posting work that's perfect. I am also an advocate of posting work that is a lot of progress for a given student that they are proud of. So in terms of sustaining effort and persistence, um, varying the demands and the resources to optimize challenge. So this is all around differentiation. And I think a lot about uh, Lucy Calkins um, Writer's Workshop. There's a lot of embedded differentiation there. And you can differentiate even further by within, let's say, Lucy's lessons, you can offer students a bullets and uh, um, a boxes and bullets organizer and tell them you can use this or you don't have to use this, right? You can give kids a compare and contrast graphic organizer and say to them, it's your choice to use this or to not use this. You can say to kids, you can write about the piece of text that we just use as a mentor text, or if you want, you can choose to write about this, this, and this text, right? So you're you're varying the demands and you're providing resources to support kids, but you're also allowing them to make their own choices about what tools they are going to use, what checklists, what tutorials, and, and you can set them up with those choices. I'm gonna go into um, community and collaboration for a second. Uh, because we're gonna end, uh, we're running out of time. So I just wanna try to get in a couple of the important um, slides that I wanna include. One of the, um, uh, you know, this top piece with the soft lighting and the dedicated areas for reading and the plants, and I, I can't emphasize how far that goes. Um, there should be areas in your classroom for social interaction and quiet areas that are places that kids can go to work and to be. And we talked already about the different seating options and a whiteboard table or a chalkboard wall where students can collaborate. It's a um, you know great tool for them to be able to work collaboratively. And this last piece is po uh, posting accountable talk prompts. So I would encourage everybody to post sentence starters and the conversational norms in your classroom in a place where everyone can see with images as well, so that when students are working in collaboration, they have safe language to use and predictable language to use. And I would go back to that language explicitly throughout the year and even ask students to self-reflect and self-evaluate, ask teams to evaluate, individual students to evaluate how well they used 
those sentence starters, how well they used those accountable talk prompts. Um, and I have a few here. I'm just gonna I'm gonna go like three minutes over if you can be patient. Um, here are some different prompts that that are possible um, for affirming, right? Thanks for explaining that. And, and really train your kids to use some of these prompts. You know, at the bottom, John Smith, you did a nice job on this and helping kids to use the prompts with each other in their conversations. Even how to disagree. And just make those roles really clear and work with your kids on cooperative learning groups so that cooperative learning uh, is a safe way to learn for kids. So I just want to show you that there are plenty of rubrics. The place that I like to go to for rubrics around cooperative learning is PBL Works. This is, um, I'm not sure this is the one from PBL Works actually, but I would suggest that you go to PBL Works for some of those rubrics. And these are some different ways, right, for to have collaboration and not but you definitely want to make your students as interdependent as possible and have them establish those relationships and make that a primary cultural piece in your classroom, that they learn from each other. Model, 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 model. Okay. This is a great, um, I took this from AJ Giuliani, who is, um, he's a PBL guy, and he does this activity where he gives the kids cards, and so pink is I feel, green is I think, blue is, or yellow is I know, and red is a question, and the kids actually have a card, and they play a card, they raise their hand, they hold up a card, and then they have to start with that sentence starter about, you know, so when you come in, you're in a situation where you're having a classroom conversation or it could be small group conversation and the kids hold up the card and they say, I feel about that, I think this, I know this. And it gives the kids um, an easy way and an unthreatening way to share predictably in the classroom conversation. Um, and then you can see there are some rules there. So that's sort of a, and then we have the fishbowl, right, which is always a great way where you have, you might have kids carry on a conversation in the middle, a dialogue, or even with you as the teacher and, and a bunch of kids sitting outside. And then um, the kids outside can make some comments about the learning and about what they observed in terms of the group process. Okay. I have a lot of protocols here um, for exploring things with kids, helping them to make meaning together. So this is um, around a piece of artwork or some other visual. It might be a primary document, a photo in, um, in social studies or science. What do you see? What do you think about? What do you wonder? And if you use, what I'm advocating is that choose a routine so that the students know it's predictable what the routine is. These are the questions that they use, um, that they're used to using. I know that I'm going to be asked what I think about this topic. I know that I'm going to be asked what puzzles me. I know that I'm going to be asked what I want to explore. Okay. Again, um, I'll let you go back to the webinar at your leisure. And you can, some compass points, when, what are you excited about, what's worrisome, what more do you need to know? And these are, so if you can see in the upper left corner, they're from Harvard Project Zero. And this is from various viewpoints. Okay. The QFT is an amazing tool. Um, you can Google the QFT. It's a question formulation technique where you might give the students a prompt, either a math program or an image or a sentence. And in collaborative groups, they brainstorm questions together. They produce questions. They write them down. They categorize the questions. Um, and it's a whole process. 
And I'm advocating here that at the beginning of your school year, you have team contracts, right? We promise to listen to each other with respect. We promise to work as best we can. We will do our you know, work on time. This is just an example. But again, you make these norms, you make these classroom agreements so that the kids feel safe. I am going to stop the webinar now. Um, I actually, you know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna keep going, but I'm also gonna give you my blessing if you need to get off. I'm going to go over by about, um, I will squeeze in the last bit before 4.30, all right? But I will understand if you check out and there'll be a recording of this webinar on our site. And again, I'm gonna send you the directions to get onto our site so that you can look up and listen to the rest of the webinar if you don't have time to stay on now. But I, I am gonna keep going just so we have it recorded for people. So in terms of sustaining effort and persistence, um, mastery-oriented feedback, let's explore that. And some of this is gonna repeat, right? But I, we, were, we talked about this. So um, self-awareness for students and defining for them what the goal is and making their progress explicit um, and using explicit support. So for example, timers can help keep kids on track and help keep kids persevering. Taking breaks within that um, you know, consulting with a peer, setting short-term goals. You can use behavior checklists, and I put in social stories of, I don't know if anyone's used them, but I've used them to great effect uh, when students are having trouble persevering. When you, you can have a picture of the student, and then it's a whole story of them working through their problem. Um, and brainstorming with kids, okay? So what do you do when you're coming up against a block or you're coming up against a wall? Uh, and helping them to choose some of these strategies that help them to persevere. And here we have underneath, you know, the different, some of the self-monitoring tools. We have portfolios, charts, graphs, journals, um, evaluation in the product. So students can use their own rubrics. When you have student-facing rubrics, you should encourage them to use their own rubrics to self-assess and self-evaluate and to question themselves. And also you should engage kids in, in peer review as well. Okay, so this last piece in terms of providing options for self-regulation. And then we go into growth mindset, right? I can't do this yet. Um, include posters and visuals of individuals struggling. Make your own struggling explicit to kids. Set yourself up as a model for what it means to overcome struggles. Take risks in your own teaching and be explicit about that with them and share stories of your own struggle and where you succeeded. Um, praise growth and effort along with mastery. Help them set short-term goals. Um, so, help them set intermediary goals so that they can have satisfaction before they get to the final goal and help them to revisit those inter intermediary goals as, as um, in addition to the long-term goal. And then this last piece we know, you know, John Hattie, he talks to us about that um, every time he redoes his factors that contribute to student success, right? Descriptive feedback, timely descriptive feedback is up there at the top. Personal coping. So we need to model for our kids around um, managing their frustration, seeking you know routines in your classroom for seeking emotional support, internal controls, um, you know, helping them to talk through. I'm not good at math. Well, what exactly does that mean? Right. What exactly are you struggling in? Let's make that concrete. It's not that you're not good at math. What exactly is hard for you? Um, and using just real life situations to demonstrate coping skills. That's part of the social, social emotional learning piece. It's important to give kids choice of seating, some different options if they need quiet time. Again, there's that quiet space. There's headphones. Um, there might be quiet music 
at the quiet space that the kid can tune into for a little while, um, have a timer there so that the kid can set the timer for himself and then come back to class when he or she is ready. Um, you know, options for sensory stimulation, options for social engagement, again. And then we have the monitoring. So we have behavioral sticker charts, um, reflect, self-reflections after a lesson, exit slips, you know, how did you do? How did you do with this? How did you do with that? And collecting that information from students. Um, I thought this was a really interesting way to help kids reflect. Um, handing in their work and having different bins. So if you have a bin for, mm, didn't really get it this time, and then I kind of feel like I got it, um, and then a, a bin for, I've got this completely 100%, you know, I need no clarification, and then encouraging kids to hand in their work by the bin that best describes how successful their learning was in that particular lesson. And then, you know, here are some prompts for exit tickets, right? What surprised you for your learning today? What was the most important thing you learned today? How do you want, what do you want to learn more about? And what made you curious? There's a teacher, um, on the teaching channel that I, I like and use her as an example a lot, she does a stoplight thing on the way out. Kids have a sticky, each they each get a sticky note and they write their name on the sticky note and all they have to do is write their name and maybe a question and put the sticky, not, sticky note on a stop stoplight. So green is all systems go, I got this today. Yellow is, hmm, I got some of it, but not all of it, and I have some questions. And red is, I'm absolutely stuck, okay? So there's the, the exit ticket stoplight strategy. And, um, and then, you know, obviously I talked about student-facing rubrics before. And this was just a cute little, um, a cute little photo of, uh, for UDL. So you have these three, kids um, sitting on the same, standing on the same box, trying to see the game. Obviously they can't all see it. And <laughs> some different variations. So the first variation to the right is, you know, they gave the kids different scaffolds, right? The little kid has two boxes and the kid in the middle has one box. And so they can all see. And then the other image on the right is they just, they made the fence see-through. Okay, so there's a lot of different ways to skin a cat. All right, I wanted to talk a little bit. Um, I want to give credit to Bill Wilmont, who is a person at CAST, from which I took a lot of the ideas from this presentation, and then also the book UDL Now. And I'm sorry, I can't remember the author right now, but I did just want to acknowledge that, um, that a lot of my resources for this presentation came from there, and that if you want to contact me about anything, there is my email. Uh, thanks for being patient with going over. I appreciate it. And um, you can, again, I will be in touch with each of you after um, the webinar is over, and I will send you uh, various uh, certification uh, certificates and directions to get on our website. All right, so thanks a lot, and have a good one.